Claire Cavanaugh will be tonight's first reader. But first, let's hear Zimborska herself reading Nothing Twice. Nic dwa razy się nie zdarza i nie zdarzy. Z tej przyczyny zrodziliśmy się bez wprawy i pomrzemy bez rutyny. Choćbyśmy uczniami byli najtępszymi w szkole świata, nie będziemy repetować żadnej zimy ani lata. Żaden dzień się nie powtórzy. Nie ma dwóch podobnych nocu, nocy, dwóch tych samych pocałunków, dwóch jednakich spojrzeń w oczy. Wczoraj, kiedy twoje imię ktoś wymówił przy mnie głośno, tak mi było, jakby róża przez otwarte wpadła okno. Dziś, kiedy jesteśmy razem, odwróciłam twarz ku ścianie. Róża? Jak wygląda róża? Czy to kwiat, a może kamień? Czemu ty się zła godzino z niepotrzebnym mieszasz lękiem? Jesteś, a więc musisz minąć. Miniesz, a więc to jest piękne. Uśmiechnięci, półobjęci, spróbujemy szukać zgody, choć różnimy się od siebie jak dwie krople czystej wody. start by reading oops too high i'll start by reading the same poem in english and then make a few remarks here before i go on nothing twice nothing can ever happen twice in consequence the sorry fact is that we arrive here improvised and leave without the chance to practice even if there is no one dumber if you're the planet's biggest dunce, you can't repeat the class in summer. This course is only offered once. No day copies yesterday. No two nights will teach what bliss is in precisely the same way with exactly the same kisses. One day, perhaps, some idle tongue mentions your name by accident. I feel as if a rose were flung into the room, all hue and scent. The next day, though you're here with me, I can't help looking at the clock. A rose, a rose, what could that be? Is it a flower or a rock? Why do we treat the fleeting day with so much needless fear and sorrow? It's in its nature not to stay. Today is always gone tomorrow. With smiles and kisses, we prefer to seek a chord beneath our star. Although we're different, we concur just as two drops of water are. Um, before I go on reading, I, I, I want to mention a few people without whom literally this book and all the books that preceded it would not exist. Um, first of all, of course, it's Szymborska herself who passed away almost three years ago. And secondly, it's my beloved dear friend and co-translator, Stanisław Baranczak. Um, who died just about a year ago after a very, very long illness. He was the reason I got started translating. He was the reason I kept going with Polish, um, which I was forced into by graduate school requirements. Um, and he and I started translating Szymborska in 1986. I realized when she died, I'd spent half my life learning how to translate Szymborska, and now um, in any case, she was very, very dear friends with Stanisław. Um, not least because she could send him the first three lines of a limerick and he could finish it in 30 minutes and fax it back to her. Um, but he had a very long, painful illness and she was so aware of it all the time and she, she threw away most of the poems she wrote. She even has poems about throwing away poems um, and wrote them on bits and pieces all over the place. And one of the poems she was working on when she died was a poem about Stanisław. I'm just gonna read the few little scraps she left there. Um, the first scrap says, so one can live in two places at once. For example, here in Krakow and there in Newtonville where Stanisław was. She was living in two places at once. She was living through his suffering. And this was the second little scrap 
This is a second entry, she writes, in the complaint book that each of us must suffer in his own indivisible way so that you can't divide up suffering, but then she imagines how possibly you could divide up suffering. She says in the last little fragment, each friend could suffer just a bit, just a few minutes in the day's course. So she had this vision of if all his friends could just divide up his suffering for him, they would lighten his burden. It's, it's, it's her, it's her completely. And it was written in little margins and cross out drafts on another poem. Um, the other, I just want to, make a couple of other thank yous because there's someone who's going to be on the stage shortly and someone out in the audience without whom none of these books would have existed. And that's Charlie Simic who received our translations back in like 1993 or something from Stanislav um, and took them to our beloved editor of over 20 years, Drinka Willen, way before Szymborska got the Nobel Prize and Drinka loved them so much she said, I think I can go out on a limb and publish a poem with a couple Z's in her name, and we'll see what happens. Um, and what happened was amazing, and Drenka worked with me and worked with us all the way through it from beginning to end, and MAP exists because Drenka did extremely intelligent hand-holding for a very long time with me, so we're really, really grateful, Stanislav, Szymborska, and I. Um, one advantage of translating really wise and wonderful poem, poets who inevitably die at some point is that they give you poems that help teach you in advance how to deal with it. This is one of her last poems called Everyone Sometime. Everyone sometime has somebody close die. Between to be or not to be, he's forced to choose the latter. We can't admit that it's a mundane fact, subsumed in the course of events, in accordance with procedure. Sooner or later, on the daily docket, the evening, late night, or first dawn docket, and explicit as an entry in an index, as a statute in a codex, as any chance date on a calendar. But such is the right and left of nature. Such, willy-nilly, is her omen and her amen. Such are her instruments and omnipotence and only on occasion, a small favor on her part. She tosses our dead loved ones into dreams. Um, this is another sort of relatively late poem. Um, something I've thought of a lot after, after her death was something James Merrill said about Elizabeth Bishop, who reminds me in, in some really important ways of, of Szymborska. Um, he, I'm paraphrasing, he said something like she gave an extraordinary, lifelong impersonation of an ordinary woman. Um, and this, this poem is, shows you exactly how extraordinary her brand of ordinariness was. It's called Among the Multitudes. I am who I am, a coincidence no less unthinkable than any other. I could have had different ancestors after all. I could have fluttered from another nest or crawled to be scaled from under another tree. Nature's wardrobe holds a fair supply of costumes, spider, seagull, fetled mouse. Each fits perfectly right off and is dutifully worn into shreds. I didn't get a choice either, but I can't complain. I could have been someone much less separate someone from an anthill, shoal, or buzzing swarm, an inch of landscape tousled by the wind, someone much less fortunate, bred for my fur or Christmas dinner, something swimming under a square of glass, a tree rooted to the ground as a fire draws near, a grass blade trampled by a stampede of incomprehensible events, a shady type whose darkness dazzled some. What if I'd prompted only fear loathing or pity. If I'd been born into the wrong tribe with all roads closed before me, fate has been kind to me thus far. I might never have been given the memory of happy moments. My yen for comparison might have been taken away. I might have been myself minus amazement. That is, someone completely different. And this is a poem 
it's always like picking which is your favorite child. Um, thank God I only have one child. It, it makes, um, but this is a poem I, I picked this time a little bit from a various series of debts. When Stanislaw became too ill to work with me, I had to rely on the kindness of, um, not of strangers, but of very dear friends like Drenka and also somebody else who will be reading, Mikhail Rushinek, um, the head of the Shimborska Foundation and a longtime friend. And one line in this translation is completely Mikhail's. I'll tell you afterwards. If you can guess it during it, no, you won't get a prize. But um, the poem is called Reciprocity. It's one of her late poems. There are catalogs of catalogs. There are poems about poems. There are plays about actors played by actors. Letters due to letters. Words used to clarify words. Brains occupied with studying brains. There are griefs as infectious as laughter. Papers emerging from waste papers. Seen glances. Conditions conditioned by the conditional. Large rivers with major contributions from small ones. Forests grown over and above by forests. Machines designed to make machines. Dreams that wake us suddenly from dreams. Health needed for regaining health. Stairs leading as much up as down. Glasses for finding glasses. Inspiration born of expiration. And even if only from time to time, hatred of hatred. All in all, ignorance of ignorance, and hands employed to wash hands. It was really hard to translate. I won't go into all the suffering, but Michal Vrushinik contributed one line. She made a, a complicated grammatical joke about a form of grammar that fortunately does not exist in English. Um, and we had to come up with a series of puns that had grammatical roots, and so conditions conditioned by the conditional. Um, Mika just reminded me how much alcohol we had to consume before we came up with that one. But that was pure Mika. That was pure Mika. Um, this one, the next one I'm going to read is one that Stanislav and I worked on for a really long time, and I'm still excruciated because the Polish bilingual edition has one line in an earlier draft, and I destroy all the drafts because I'm so humiliated by everything that we ever did wrong. Um, this one is, is all everything we finally came up with, and one line, I don't remember who exactly did what in this, it's a while ago, one line is completely Stanislav, and I'll tell you which one in the end, because he was so happy. Um, it's called Birthday. So much world all at once, how it rustles and bustles, Moraines and morays and morasses and mussels. The flame, the flamingo, the flounder, the feather. How to line them all up, how to put them together. All the thickets and crickets and creepers and creeks. The beaches and leeches alone could take weeks. Chinchillas, gorillas, and sarsaparillas. Thanks so much, but this excess of kindness could kill us. Where's the jar for this burgeoning burdock, brooks babble, rooks squabble, snakes squiggle, abundance and trouble? How to plug up the gold mines and pin down the fox. How to cope with the lynx, bobolinx, streptococks. Take dioxide, a lightweight but mighty in deeds. What about octopodes? What about centipedes? I could look into prices but don't have the nerve. These are products I just can't afford, don't deserve. Isn't sunset a little too much for two eyes that who knows may not open to see the sun rise? I am just passing through, it's a five minute stop. I won't catch what is distant, what's too close I'll mix up. While trying to plumb what the void's inner sense is, I'm bound to pass by all these poppies and pansies. What a loss when you think how much effort was spent perfecting this pedal, this pistol, this scent. For the one time appearance, which is all they're allowed, so aloofly precise and so fragilely proud. Um, the line that I remember Stanislav just beaming, he had this really great beam, um, was chinchillas, gorillas, and sarsaparillas. And he's a Pole, non-native English speaker. He came up with that line. <laughs> you know, just, um, this is an early poem she wrote some of the greatest love poems ever written. 
some of which you'd never even recognize are love poems, and likewise elegies, poems of mourning, and you have to work so hard to figure out exactly where the mourning is, but this is an early, um, a relatively early love poem. Nothingness unseemed itself for me too. It turned itself wrong side out. How on earth did I end up here, head to toe among the planets, without a clue how I used not to be? Oh, you encountered here and loved here. I can only guess my arm on yours. How much vacancy on that side went to make us? How much silence there for one lone cricket here? How much non-meadow for a single sprig of sorrel? And sun after darknesses and a drop of dew as repayment for what boundless droughts? Starry willy-nilly, local in reverse, stretched out in curvatures, weights, roughnesses, and motions. Time out from infinity for endless sky, relief for non -space, from non-space in a shivering birch tree shape. Now or never wind will stir a cloud, since wind is exactly what won't blow there. And a beetle hits the trail in a witness's dark suit, testifying to the long wait for a short life. And it so happened that I'm here with you, and I really see nothing usual in that. And the final poem I'm going to read is the final, the final completed poem. I spend a long time pretending it was just the most recent poem, not the last poem. Um, this is the poem after which the book is titled Map. Flat as the table it's placed on, Nothing moves beneath it, and it seeks no outlet. Above, my human breath creates no stirring air and leaves its total surface undisturbed. Its plains, valleys are always green. Uplands, mountains are yellow and brown, while seas, oceans remain a kindly blue beside the tattered shores. Everything here is small, near, accessible. I can press volcanoes with my fingertip, stroke the poles without thick mittens. I can, with a single glance, encompass every desert with the river lying just beside it. A few trees stand for ancient forests. You couldn't lose your way among them. In the east and west, above and below the equator, quiet like pins dropping, and in every black pinprick people keep on living. Mass graves and sudden ruins are out of the picture. Nations' borders are barely visible, as if they wavered to be or not. I like maps because they lie, because they give no access to the vicious truth, because great-heartedly, good-naturedly, they spread before me a world not of this world. Thank you. Kilkunastoletnia. Ja kilkunastoletnia. Gdyby nagle tu, teraz, stanęła przede mną. Czy mogłabym ją witać jako osobę bliską, chociaż jest dla mnie obca i daleka? Uronić łezkę, pocałować w czółko, z tej wyłącznie przyczyny, że mamy jednakową datę urodzenia? Tyle niepodobieństwa między nami, że chyba tylko kości są te same, sklepienie czaszki, oczodoły, bo już jej oczy jakby trochę większe, rzęsy dłuższe, wzrost wyższy i całe ciało obleczone ściśle skórą gładką, bez skazy. Łączą nas wprawdzie krewni, znajomi, ale w jej świecie prawie wszyscy żyją, a w moim prawie nikt z tego wspólnego kręgu. Tak mocno się różnimy, tak Całkiem o czym innym myślimy, mówimy. Ona wie mało 
za to z uporem godnym lepszej sprawy. Ja wiem o wiele więcej, za to nie na pewno. Pokazuje mi wiersze, pisane pismem starannym, wyraźnym, jakim ja nie piszę już od lat. Czytam te wiersze, czytam. No może ten jeden, gdyby go skrócić i w paru miejscach poprawić. Reszta niczego dobrego nie wróży. Rozmowa się nie klei. Na jej biednym zegarku czas chwiejny jeszcze i tani. Na moim dużo droższy i dokładny. Na pożegnanie nic, dawkowy uśmiech i żadnego wzruszenia. Dopiero kiedy znika i zostawia w pośpiechu swój szalik. Szalik z prawdziwej wełny w kolorowe paski przez naszą matkę zrobione dla niej szydełkiem. Przechowuję go jeszcze. Me, a teenager, if she suddenly stood here now before me, would I need to treat her as near and dear, although she's strange to me and distant? shed a tear, kiss her brow, for the simple reason that we share a birth date. So many dissimilarities between us that only the bones are likely still the same, the cranial vault, the eye sockets. Since her eyes seem a little larger, her eyelashes are longer, she's taller, and the whole body is tightly sheathed in smooth, unblemished skin. Relatives and friends still link us, it is true. But in her world, nearly all are living, while in mine almost no one survives from that shared circle. We differ so profoundly, talk and think about completely different things. She knows next to nothing, but with a doggedness deserving better causes. I know much more, but not for sure. She shows me poems written in a clear and careful script I haven't used for years. I read the poems, read them. Well, maybe that one, if it were shorter and touched up in a couple of places, the rest do not bode well. The conversation stumbles. On her pathetic watch, time is still cheap and unsteady. On mine, it's far from precious and precise far more precious and precise. Nothing in parting, a fixed smile and no emotion. Only when she vanishes, leaving her scarf in her haste, a scarf of genuine wool in colored stripes, crocheted for her by our mother. I've still got it. I became Wisława Szymborska's assistant in 1996, a few weeks after she was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. I was supposed to be doing it for just three months, between the grant and the presentation, and afterward, things were going to work out one way or another. But I ended up doing it for 15 years to the very end. The Nobel Prize was not exactly the kiss of death for her, but it definitely paralyzed her for quite a long time. While she returned to writing a column in the spring of 1997, she was not to write a poem until the year 2000. She kept repeating that she had sacrificed a poem to write her noble address. What she intended to say in the form of a poem went into the speech. That's why my address was so short, she said. At the very outset, she asked me to refrain from commenting on her poems. If you criticize me, that'll hurt me. And if you praise me, I won't believe you anyway. I confined myself to timid suggestions about punctuation. Wisława was not inordinately fond of commas. Their absence in the obvious places somewhat bothered the brand new graduate of the Polish Studies Department in me. I would receive the typescript, executed with a, a carbon copy, which she would keep when giving me the original, usually with her handwritten 
corrections. I would then retype the poem on the computer and bring her the printout the following day with some commas suggested by me. Her last books of poetry contain quite a lot of my commas. <laughs> this is my contribution to Polish literature. <laughs> we used to share a laugh saying that one day I might see the publication of my collected commas. <laughs> when I received those first poems to be retyped, I was deeply moved. I had the feeling that my work was finally making sense. The situation was back to normal and we had managed to organize what we called the office so that Szymborska was able to write again. It was a very important day for me. To her, a poem was a conversation, encouragement for even more conversation, always an opening, never categorically with the period at the end. It was always something, something important, painful, interesting, paradoxical, funny, significant, sometimes also current, but those poems are actually the ones she was least happy with. The subjects she wrote on needed to spend some time in waiting, to season. Szymborska did not remember the title of her poems. She would just remember the topic. When uh, selecting poems for the readings, uh, she would say, for instance, the one about the terrorist, the one about happy love, the one about the cat. She never wrote books of poetry. She just wrote poems. Once she had accumulated about 20, she would arrange them into a sequence, sometimes discarding a few. She would come up with the title for the whole as the last thing. Sometimes she would change it at the very last moment. The volume Tutai, here, was originally supposed to be titled Details, but she changed it when she realized how awkward it would sound if someone went into a bookstore and said, I'd like Szymborska's details. There was only one title she devised before she had the poems, the title Vistarczy, Enough. She intended it as the title of her last book of poems. For a while, it was to be the title of the book now known as Tutaj, here. But uh, Szymborska realized that she still wanted to write, that there would probably be another one. When she got back home from the hospital two months before her death, I brought her a folder with printouts of the last 13 poems. She didn't feel like ordering them into a sequence anymore. That was to become Vistarczy, Enough, an unfinished volume published posthumously by Wydawnictwo Apięć. Let me go back to the year 2000. My wife, who is here with me tonight, after giving birth to our daughter, Natalka, and nursing her through the earliest period of infancy, went back to work. I used my rare free moments to work on my doctoral dissertation. Usually I just wrote at night. In the morning I uh, would feed Natalka and wait for either of the grannies to come up and take over. One day about 10 in the morning, as usual, Natalka was seated at the table, harnessed into her high chair, and I was feeding her some pap while drinking my coffee. The phone rang, and by the phone I mean the fixed, well, fixed line. I went into another room to answer it, picked it up, and turned around toward, Nat toward Natalka, just as she began to pull the cloth from the table. One second later, everything was just um, on, landed on the floor. Instead of saying yes or hello, I yelled something inarticulate into the phone. Wisława, because of course it was her calling, asked what happened. I described the situation, expecting to hear even the smallest expression of sympathy. No way, not from a poet. What I heard was, you know what? This is a good topic for a poem. And she hung up. <laughs> a few months later, I was given a poem to retype, Mała dziewczynka ściąga obrus, a little girl tugs at the tablecloth. It looks like my child already has a place in the history of Polish literature. <laughs> Let me read the poem now. She's been in this world for over a year, and in this world not everything, sorry, she's been in this world for uh, over a year, and in this, in this world not everything's been examined and taken in hand. The subject of today, today's investigation is things that don't move themselves. They need to be helped along, shoved, shifted, taken from their place, 
and relocated. They don't all want to go. For example, the bookshelf, the cupboard, the unyielding walls, the table. But the tablecloth on the stubborn table, when well seized by its hems, manifests a willingness to travel. <laughs> and the glasses, plates, creamer, spoons, bowl, are fairly shaking with desire. It's fascinating. What form of motion will they take once they are trembling on the brink? What, mm, uh, uh, I'm sorry, will they roam across the ceiling, fly around the lamp, hop onto the windowsills, and from there to a tree? Mr. Newton still has no say in this. Let him look down from the heavens and wave his hands. This experiment must be completed, and it will. This, however, is not the end of the story. The poem was sent to Barbara Toruncik, the editor of uh, Literary Quarterly, Zeszyty Literackie, and printed in the 2001. Two years later, when the little girl was joined in this world by a little boy, Kuba, I received a letter from the editor-in-chief. Dear sir, please work harder on Kuba's pranks. We will cover any and all damage as long as it ends for us the same way as in the case of little girl. <laughs> Regrettably, the procedure never repeated itself. That, of course, was not because my kids ceased to destroy things far from it. The poem caught Czesław Miłosz's fancy. At a dinner given by Szymborska for a few friends, he observed that the poem touched upon some fundamental philosophical issues which had been grappled with, uh, with by uh, Lev Shestov and Fyodor Dostoevsky in The Brothers Karamazov. Szymborska tried to protest, saying it, it was a poem about Natalka, about an infant discover, discovering the law of gravity. She even called upon me to stand witness, to relate what happened that morning at 10 o'clock. Miłosz just waved his hand in resignation and later elaborated on his in interpretation ideas in the essay Wisława Szymborska and the Great Inquisitor, <laughs> published in uh, De Dekada Literacka. Subsequently translated into English, it became the subject of Polish-American seminar organized in Krakow <laughs> by the University of Houston. Uh, let me quote uh, one sentence from there. It's a moving poem by Szymborska about the amazement with which all of us once discovered the way the world works. It belongs, we feel, to the sphere of innocence always dear to us. Yet it is not, in fact, an innocent poem. Because what does it mean to find out about the law of gravity? There is nothing more alien to fairy tale than the law. We should be able to leave off the ground, to levitate, for instance, or jump out of the window and fly like Bulgakov's Margarita to join the Valpurgis night or mount a broomstick like Harry Potter." Unquote. The further we go on, the more serious things get. Miłosz argues that the little girl's experiment is underpinned by fundamental questions of chance, necessity, and divine will. The little girl is bound to find out soon that the law of gravity might as well be um, called the law of necessities linked in chain of causes and effects. This is followed by invocations of Kierkegaard, Shestov, Dostoevsky, Bok, and finally Simone Weil, with her determinism expressed through the concept of la paix en terre, or the, fond, uh, or the force of gravity with which uh, only the grace of God is exempt. It looks, then, as if behind Szymborska's innocent poem, Miłosz con concludes, gaped an abyss where one can descend almost infinitely, a dark labyrinth which all of us, when, whether we wish to or not, roam in the course of our lives. In the meantime, Natalka has grown up, not enough to read Kierkegaard yet, but who knows what will grab her attention in the coming years. Um, this is the end of the story. Um, uh, I'm here because um, uh, I, I'm now, uh, the, I run the Wisława Szymborska Foundation. The foundation was formed in uh, 2012 by Wisława Szymborska, Last Will and Testament. It uh, strives to support or all initiatives relating to the reading and study of poetry, and not only that of our uh, pa patron poetess. Furthermore, in, in, in accordance with her will, 
The foundation provides financial support to artists, writers, and translators who have found themselves in a difficult situation and grants an annual award named after her to honor the author of the best book of poems of the year. Uh, and you will soon uh, hear um, uh, Kristina Dombrovska, Krisha Dombrovska, reading her poems. And Krisha Dombrovska is the first, um, her Kristina Dombrovska's book of poems, um, White Chairs, uh, was the first um, book to be awarded by, by us. Mm. The foundation is also involved in um, promotion of Wisława Szymborska's work in Poland and abroad, organizing meetings devoted to her memory and poetry in collaboration with various cultural institutions in a number of cities around Poland and throughout the world. Szymborska's readers are also given an opportunity to view an exhibition of her collages, um, a superb complementation of her poetic work. I hope to show uh, the, these collages to you in New York City soon. Thank you very much. Radość pisania. Dokąd biegnie ta napisana szarna przez napisany las? Czy z napisanej wody pić, która jej pyszczek odbije jak kalka? Dlaczego łeb podnosi, czy coś słyszy? Na pożyczonych z prawdy czterech nóżkach wsparta spod moich palców uchem strzyże. Cisza. Ten wyraz też szeleści po papierze i rozgarnia spowodowane słowem las gałęzie. Nad białą kartką czają się do skoku litery, które mogą ułożyć się źle. Zdania osaczające, przed którymi nie będzie ratunku. Jest w kropli atramentu spory zapas myśliwych z przymrużonym okiem, gotowych zbiec po stromym piórze w dół, otoczyć sarnę, złożyć się do strzału. Zapominają, że tu nie jest życie. Inne, czarno na białym, panują tu prawa. Okamgnienie trwać może tak długo, jak zechce. Pozwoli się podzielić na małe wieczności pełne wstrzymanych w locie kul. Na zawsze, jeśli każe, nic się tu nie stanie. Bez mojej woli nawet liść nie spadnie, ani źdźbło się nie ugnie pod kropką kopytka. Jest więc taki świat, nad którym los sprawuje niezależny, Czas, który wiąże łańcuchami znaków, istnienie na mój rozkaz nieustanne, radość pisania, możność utrwalania, zemsta ręki śmiertelnej. Good evening. I am here uh, because, uh, as Michał said, uh, I received this uh, prize, uh, Wisława Szymborska Prize. And people often ask me, um, because of this prize, if I am inspired by Szymborska. And I think she was such a great poet and such um, original, her voice is such original that you cannot really write like her. And uh, it's just impossible. Uh, but actually, what I read recently about her inspired me. Uh, I read that uh, when she was a child, or it was in her early youth, I don't remember exactly, she had a pet hedgehog. And she was very, very worried because this hedgehog fell in love with a scrubbing brush. And <laughs> <laughs> so I thought it is such a beautiful story and really sad story that why she didn't write a poem about it. So I decided like I will r write a poem and I wrote a poem and this is like some kind of uh, her poetical gift to me. But I will start with the poem uh, which we just heard. Uh, Szymborska was reading it in Polish. I will read it uh, in English. This is the joy of writing. 
Why does this written dough bound through these written woods? For a drink of written water from a spring whose surface will Xerox her soft muzzle? Why does she lift her head? Does she, does she hear something? Perched on four slim legs, borrowed from the truth, she pricks up her ears beneath my fingertips. Silence. This word also rustles across the page and parts the both that have sprouted from the word woods. Lying in wait, set to pounce on the blank page, are letters up to no good, clutches of clothes, so subordinate they will never let her get away. Each drop of ink contains a fair supply of hunters equipped with squinting eyes behind their sides, prepared to swarm the sloping pen at any moment, surround the door, and slowly aim their guns. They forget that what's here isn't life, other laws black and white obtain. The twinkling of an eye will take as long as I say, and will, if I wish, divide into tiny eternities full of bullets stopped in mid-flight. Not a thing will ever happen unless I say so. Without my blessing, not a leaf will fall, not a blade of grass will bend beneath that little hoof's full stop. Is there then a word where I rule absolutely on fate, a time I bind with chains of signs, an existence become endless at my bidding, the joy of writing, the power of preserving revenge of a mortal hand. And um, I chose also another poem, which is because this poem, The Joy of Writing, is some kind of uh, Ars Poetica of Szymborska, and there is another poem much darker called Autotomy, which is also kind of her Ars Poetica. And it was written in, uh, to commemorate Halina Poświatowska, uh, who was a Polish poet, uh, who died very young of a uh, heart disease. Uh, she died when she was 32, I think. And Szymborska was kind of her poetic mentor, or yeah, the person whom Halina Poświatowska showed her poems. Uh, autotomy. In danger, the holotherian cuts itself in two. It abandons oneself to a hungry world, and with the other self, it flees. It violently divides into doom and salvation, retribution and reward, what has been and what will be. An abyss appears in the middle of its body, between what instantly become two foreign shores. Life on one shore, death on the other. Here hope and there despair. If there are scales, the pants don't move. If there is justice, this is it. To die just as required, without excess. To grow back just what's needed from what's left. We too can divide ourselves. It's true. But only into flesh and a broken whisper into flesh and poetry. The throat on one side, the latter on the other, quiet, quickly dying out. Here, the heavy heart, there, non omnis moriar, just three little words, like a flight's three feathers. The abyss doesn't divide us, the abyss surrounds us. And the third poem I chose, I, I just chose my favorite poems, it was very difficult because there are so many of them. But this one, I think, is, is just my favorite. It's called Our Ancestors' uh, Short Lives, uh, but I think it's also, it's not only about our ancestors, but um, about us. Our Ancestors' Short Lives. Few of them made it to 30. Old age was the privilege of rocks and trees. Childhood ended as fast as wolf cubs grow. One had to hurry to get on with life before the sun went down, before the first snow. Thirteen years old bearing children, four years old stalking birds' nests in the rushes, leading the hunt at twenty. They aren't yet, 
then they are gone. Infinity's ends fused quickly, which is truth charms with all the teeth of youth intact. A son grew to manhood beneath his father's eye. Beneath the grandfather's blank sockets, the grandson was born. And anyway, they didn't count the years. They counted nets, pots, sheds, and axes. Time so generous toward any petty star in the sky offered them a nearly empty hand and quickly took it back, as if the effort were too much. One step more, two steps more, along the glittering river that sprang from darkness and vanished into darkness. There wasn't a moment to lose. No deferred questions, no belated revelations, just those experienced in time. Wisdom couldn't wait for gray hair. It had to see clearly before it saw the light and to hear every voice before it sounded. Good and evil, they knew little of them but knew all. When evil triumphs, good goes into hiding. When good is manifest, then evil lies low. Neither can be conquered or cast off beyond return. Hence, if joy, then with a touch of fear, if despair, then not without some quiet hope. Life, however long, will always be short too short for anything to be added. Well, I, I chose uh, poems which are quite uh, dramatic, and, uh, but, but I think Szymborska is often, at least in Poland, she's often perceived as a very witty, playful poet, like kind of elegant lady of poetry. And I think readers um, often forget about her darker side and um, um, I like that darker side in Szymborska. This is a very moving poem for me. It's called Tortures. Nothing has changed. The body is susceptible to pain. It has to eat and breathe the air and sleep. It has thin skin and the blood is just beneath it. An adequate supply of teeth and fingernails. Its bones can be broken. Its joints can be stretched. In tortures, all this is taken into account. Nothing has changed. The body shudders as it shuddered before the founding of Rome and after, in the 20th century before and after Christ. Tortures are just as they were. Only the earth has grown smaller. And what happens sounds as if it's happening in the next room. Nothing has changed. It's just that there are more people, and beside the old offenses, new ones have sprung, real, make-believe, short-lived, and non-existent. But the hole with which the body answers to them was, is, and ever will be a cry of innocence according to the age-old scale and pitch. Nothing has changed, except perhaps the manners, ceremonies, dances. Yet the movement of hands to shield the head remains the same. The body writhes, jerks, and tries to pull away. Its legs fail, it falls, its knees jackknife. It bruises, swells, dribbles, and bleeds. Nothing has changed, except for the course of rivers, the lines of forests, coasts, deserts, and glaciers. Amid those landscapes, roams the soul, disappears, returns, draws nearer, moves away, a stranger to itself, elusive, now sure, now uncertain of its own existence, while the body is and is and is and has nowhere to go. And another um, poem which um, which has this um, special <laughs> quality for me because it's, it combines some kind of lyricism and, and dramatism with, with a humor and with, um, and with something very psychologically insightful. It's called Lot's Wife. 
They say I looked back out of curiosity, but I could have had other reasons. I looked back, mourning my silver bowl, carelessly while tying my sandal strap, so I wouldn't have to keep staring at the righteous nape of my husband Lot's neck. From the sudden conviction that if I dropped dead, he wouldn't so much as hesitate. From the disobedience of the meek, checking for pursuers, struck by the silence, hoping God had changed his mind. Our two daughters were already vanishing over the hilltop. I felt age within me, distance, the futility of wandering, torpor. I looked back, setting my bundle down. I looked back, not knowing where to set my foot. Serpents appeared on my path, spiders, field mice, baby vultures. They were neither good nor evil now. Every living thing was simply creeping or hopping along in the mass panic. I looked back in desolation, in shame, because we had stolen away, wanting to cry out to go home, or only when a sudden gust of wind unbound my hair and lifted up my robe. It seemed to me that they were watching from the walls of Sodom and bursting into tenderous laughter again and again. I looked back in anger to savor their terrible fate. I looked back for all the reasons given above. I looked back involuntarily. It was only a rock that turned underfoot, growling at me. It was a sudden crack that stopped me in my tracks. A hamster on its hind paws tottered on the edge. It was then we both glanced back. No, no, I ran on, I crept, I flew upward until darkness fell from the heavens and with its scorching gravel and dead birds. I couldn't breathe and spun around and around. Anyone who saw me must have thought I was dancing. It's not inconceivable that my eyes were open. It's possible I fell facing the city. And the last uh, poem I chose, I, I wasn't sure if to read it or not, because it's, uh, the title is The Terrorist He's Watching. And of course, everybody now uh, are talking about terrorism, and I don't like the kind of poetical journalism, but uh, Szymborska wrote this uh, poem in the 70s, and unfortunately it's still very universal and up to date. Uh, and I think I, I've never read really uh, in poetry anything as uh, as sharp and, uh, uh, and, and as good uh, about uh, terrorism. The terrorist he's watching. The bomb, in the, bar, the bomb in the bar will explode at 13.20. Now it's just 13.16. There is still time for some to go in and some to come out. The terrorist has already crossed the street. The distance keep him out of danger. And what a view, just like the movies. A woman in a yellow jacket. She is going in. A man in dark glasses, he is coming out. Teenagers in jeans, they are talking. 13, 17 and four seconds. The short one, he is lucky. He is getting on a scooter, but the tall one, he is going in. 13, 17 and 40 seconds. That girl, she is walking along with a green ribbon in her hair, but then, a bus suddenly pulls in front of her. 13, 18, the girl's gone. Was she that dumb? Did she go in or not? We will see when they carry them out. 13, 19, somehow no one's going in. Another guy, fat, bald, is leaving though. Wait a second, looks like he's looking for something in his pockets and at 13, 20 minus 10 seconds, 
he goes back in for his crummy gloves. 1320, exactly. This waiting, it's taking forever. Any second now. No, not yet. Yes, now. The bomb, it explodes. Okay, thank you. Przylot. Tej wiosny znowu ptaki wróciły za wcześnie. Ciesz się rozumie. Instynkt też się myli. Zagapi się przy oczy i spadają w śnieg. I giną licho. Giną nie na miarę budowy swojej krtani i arcypazurków, rzetelnych chrząstek i sumiennych błon do rzecza serca labiryntu jeli, tnawy, żeber i kręgów w świetnej amfiladzie, piór godnych pawilonu w Muzeum Wszechrzemiosł i dzioba mniejszej cierpliwości. To nie jest lament, to tylko zgorszenie, że anioł z prawdziwego białka, latawiec o gruczołach z pieśni nad pieśniami, pojedynczy w powietrzu, nieprzeliczony w ręce, tkanka po tkance związany we wspólność Miejsca i czasu, jak sztuka klasyczna, w brawach skrzydeł spada i kładzie się obok kamienia, który w swój archaiczny i prostacki sposób patrzy na życie jak na odrzucane próby. Good evening. Um, uh, I was rereading uh, Szybowska's poems after you know, some years, uh, and uh, I was struck, I mean, how consistently good she is. Uh, I mean, it's a big book, a lot of poems, and uh, you know, you don't come upon poems that you feel, well, this is really not so good and uh, shouldn't be included here. Uh, you know, how smart, witty, and level-headed she, she is, uh, how she uh, seduces us by her wide range of interests, her atypical lack of narcissism for a poet, and her cheerful pessimism. Uh, she has a high regard for both reality and imagination. Uh, nevertheless, she insists on making sure the two are not confused. Uh, in, in a funny little poem, uh, she tells us, um, I love this, uh, she says, considering how bleak things are elsewhere in the universe, in some ways life on our little planet is quite a bargain even when one takes wars and other evils into consideration. Um, the other thought I had, you know, reading her work, I mean, her poems and her marvelous collection of her prose, non-required reading, which consists of uh, newspaper pieces that are two, two and a half, three pages, sometimes long, uh, all reviews of, of, of books really uh, well, as she just says, none required readings. Uh, uh, including there's a there's a book by Dale Carnegie, uh, uh, a lovely book, marvelously. I mean, marvelous book, marvelously translated by Claire Cavanaugh, and that you know, gave me the other thought. I mean, the the, the, the strength of of, uh, of the, her, the translate translations of these translations and and the. The reason she's famous is really due to Baranchek and, and Claire Cavanaugh. I mean, there, there have been you know, many great poets in Europe and uh, you know, in the 20th century and you know, South America uh, who uh, really you know, did not have the greatest translators. And uh, you know, we think we know they are sort of great, but uh, when we look at their poems, uh, 
we have some questions. Uh, uh, so, I mean, she really uh, is lucky in that respect. Uh, Baranchek was an amazing man. I mean, I knew him, you know, shortly after he came to the United States, and his knowledge of English, I mean, it was, uh, just, you know, idiomatic English, I mean, vast vocabulary was, was amazing, I mean, incredible. Uh, so, uh, when, you know, Claire was talking about his contributions, I could, I could hear the kind of things that he loved. Uh, uh, the poem that you, uh, Borska, you just heard, uh, is not the first poem that I'm going to read. Uh, uh, rather, than the first poem of hers that I ever read, uh, which was in an anthology called Post-War Polish Poetry, uh, edited by Czesław Milos, that came out uh, I think in, 19, in the 60s, mid 1960s, um, and most of the poets in the, in the book were unfamiliar to me, uh, including uh, Szymborska, uh, and uh, uh, here is a poem uh, called 4 a.m. The hour between night and day, the hour between toss and turn, the hour of 30 year olds, the hour swept clean for roosters crowing. The hour when the earth takes back its warm embrace. The hour of cool drafts from extinguished stars. The hour of do we vanish too without a trace. Empty hour, hollow, vain, rock bottom of all the other hours. No one feels fine at 4 a.m. If ants feel fine at 4 a.m., we are happy for the ants. <laughs> and let 5 a.m. come if we got to go on living. As a lifelong uh, insomniac, I mean, I, that this poem astonished me because <laughs> bringing in the ants, of course, I mean, I know. You know, the, the infinite number of things that one <laughs> thinks at, the, at 4 a.m. Uh, uh, but to bring the ants uh, <laughs> seems so wonderfully, wonderfully appropriate. And uh, uh, so uh, the next poem will be the poem that you heard her read called Returning Birds. Um, this spring, the birds came back again too early. Rejoice, O reason, instinct, and air, too. It gathers wool, it dozes off, and down they f fall into the snow, into a foolish fate, a debt that doesn't suit their well wrought throats and splendid claws. Their honest cartilage and conscientious webbing, the hard, sensible sluice, the entrails maze, the nave of ribs, the vertebra in stunning enfilades, feathers deserving their own wing in any craft's museum, the Benedictine patience of the beak. This is not a dirge, no, it's only indignation. An angel made of earthbound protein, a living kite with glands straight from the song of songs, singular in air, without number in the hand, its tissues tied into a common knot of place and time, as, an, as in an Aristotelian drama, unfolding to the wings applause, falls down and lies beside a stone, which in its own archaic, simple-minded way sees life <coughs> as a chain of failed attempts. I find this poem especially poignant because uh, where I live in, and I've been living for a long time in New Hampshire, uh, uh, we have fewer and fewer birds return uh, in the spring because of the climate changes and it's, it's really sad. A poem called Could Have. I mean, I kind of obviously think of World War II uh, 
all the things that could have you know happened to you if but you survived and could have and so forth or any any life ever you know uh, I mean think of people in you know in, in Paris and uh, uh, recently and the terrorist attack could have it could have happened it had to have it had to happen. It happened earlier, later, nearer, farther off. It happened, but not to you. You were saved because you were the first. You were saved because you were the last, alone with others, on the right, the left, because it was raining, because of the shade, because the day was sunny. You were in luck, there was a forest. You were in luck, there were no trees. You were in luck, a rake, a hook, a beam, a break, a jam, a turn, a quarter inch, an instant. You were in luck. Just then, a straw went floating by. As a result, because although despite what would have happened if a hand, a foot, within an inch, a hair's breadth from an unfortunate coincidence. So you are here, still dizzy from another dodge, close shave, reprieve, one hole in the net and you slip through I couldn't be more shocked or speechless. Listen how your heart pounds inside me. Uh, nature's, oh, that's what this is from for. <laughs> uh, poem called um, uh, The Suicide's Room. I'll bet you think the room was empty, wrong. There were three chairs with sturdy backs, a lamp good for fighting the dark, a desk, and on the desk a wallet, some newspapers, a carefree Buddha, and a worried Christ. Seven lucky elephants, a notebook in a drawer. You think our dresses weren't in it, no books, no pictures, no records, you guess, wrong. A comforting trumpet poised in black hands, Saskia and her cordial little flower. Joy, the spark of gods. Odysseus stretched on the shelf in life-giving sleep after the labors of book five. The moralists with the golden syllables of their names inscribed on finely tanned spines. Next to them, the politicians braced their backs. No way out, but what about the door? No prospect, the, wid the window had other views. His glasses lay on the windowsill and one fly buzzed, that is, was still alive. You think at least the note must tell us something. What if, I, what if I say there was no note and he had so many friends, but all of us fit neatly inside the empty envelope propped up against the cup? In praise of my sister, My sister doesn't write poems, and it's unlikely that she'll suddenly start writing poems. She takes after her mother, who didn't write poems, and also her father, who likewise didn't write poems. I feel safe beneath my sister's roof. My sister's husband would rather die than write poems. <laughs> and even though this is starting to sound as repetitive as Peter Piper, the truth is, none of my relatives write poems. My sister's desk drawers don't hold old poems, and her handbag doesn't hold new ones. When my sister asks me over for lunch, I know she doesn't want to read me her poems. Her soups are delicious without ulterior motives. Her coffee doesn't spill on manuscripts. There are many families in which nobody writes poems. 
But once it starts up, it's hard to quarantine. Sometimes poetry cascades down through the generations, creating fatal whirlpool wheels where family love may founder. My sister has tackled oral prose with some success, but her entire written opus consists of postcards from vacations, whose text is only the same promise every year. When she gets back, she'll have so much, much, much to tell. The final poem, uh, it's a, you know, one thing that happens with, uh, if you're a poet and you're reading Shibosca, you know, you said to yourself, why didn't I think of this? <laughs> you kind of thought of it, but maybe, you know, dismissed it, or, or even some, sometimes tried it, but it didn't turn out so well. Uh, this is called View with a Grain of Sand. We call it a grain of sand but it calls itself neither grain nor sand. It does it just fine without a name, whether general, particular, permanent, passing, incorrect, or apt. Our glance, our touch mean nothing to it. It doesn't feel itself seen and touched, and that it fell on the window sill is only our experience, not its. For it, it is no different from falling on anything else, with no assurance that it has finished falling or that it is falling still. The window has a wonderful view of, of a lake, but the view doesn't view itself. It exists in this world, colorless, shapeless, soundless, odorless, and painless. The lake's floor exists flawlessly and it sure exists shorelessly. Its water feels itself neither wet nor dry, and its waves to themselves are neither singular nor plural. They splash deaf to the noise, they splash deaf to their own noise, on pebbles neither large nor small. And all this beneath the sky by nature skyless, in which the sun sets without setting at all and hides without hiding behind an unminding cloud. The wind ruffles it, its only reason being that it blows, a second passes, a second second, a third, but there are three seconds only for us. Time has passed like a courier with urgent news, but that's just our simile. The character is invented, his haste is make-believe, his news inhuman. Thank you. Thank you.